Hey everyone, today I'm going to go over some tips and tricks to help prepare you for week one of Hyjal and Black Temple. So first off, most important thing, you got to know the fights beforehand. So make sure you watch videos, read guides, whatever, but just make sure that you've done some research and you kind of know what you're getting into beforehand. It's really important for tanks to do this because our mistakes are usually felt by the raid a lot more than other people's mistakes. So... If you prep ahead of time, it's really going to help out your guild. Also, you're going to want to be defensive-minded for the early weeks of Hajal and Black Temple. These aren't really the weeks to be parsing. Just try to play it safe with like your gear choices, talent choices, stuff like that. Because any time you die, there's a pretty good chance of a wipe and if you wipe you're gonna lose time your guild's already probably not gonna have enough time to kill all the bosses week one maybe even first few weeks so any wipe you can save is potentially an extra boss kill your guild will get for the week so that's huge so before your first actual raid where you're killing bosses you can go into hyjal and just farm some trash and you can do this with probably about 10 people and if you only have around 10 you would probably just clear the first five waves of trash and these are going to be all the waves before the abomination waves which are going to be the harder waves so you should be able to do it with relatively few people just make sure you get like all the npcs involved that'll help you a lot and the purpose of this you'll get a lot of rep you'll get a chance at items um, main item prop values are looking for is the hammer of judgment that's going to be our best weapon until we can get a tempest of chaos or possibly a vengeful gladiator's gavel but that that's going to be a really awesome weapon for you and you can get it just day one off trash so that's pretty great and you're also going to be able to farm some gems gems are going to be in super short supply the new epic gems so if you can get your guild in there farming some gems that's going to help you guys a ton and you're also going to get hearts of darkness you can craft some shower resist gear earlier that'll help your healers out for like asgalore as well as mother shiraz obviously and as far as rep if you do the five wave trash farm you're going to get about 576 rep per clear the first wave of trash does not actually give rep. That's the 10 ghoul wave. I believe it doesn't give items either, but I can verify that. So really you're looking at wave two through five. That's where you're going to get like your rep and items. And if you have more people, like maybe 15 plus, you could do a full eight wave trash clear on the Ridge Winter Chill Trash. And this shouldn't save you to the instance, but that is something to kind of keep an eye on. If it doesn't save you to the instance killing the trash, which I'm presuming it won't, but in Nax, Frozen Rune looting did uh, save you to the instance. But in this case, you're only killing trash. I don't think it's going to save you to the instance. Um, you can just, after you clear what you want to clear, just zone out uh you'll probably need to die to do that um but get everybody out of the instance just do reset all instances and you'll have a fresh one if you don't zone out and reset the instance you gotta wait about five minutes for jana to respawn and it'll probably take a minute or two for trash to actually kill her so it might be like seven minutes total to do a reset if you don't actually zone out to reset and if you do the 8-wave clear, you're going to get 1,032 rep for that clear. Uh, the rep breakdown for Hajal is 12 rep per trash mob, and then 60 rep for frost worms, but that's not going to be part of the trash farm. Those are only in the horde base. Uh, you're going to get 375 rep per boss kill, and then 1,500 rep for an Archimond kill. And as far as I know, the rep from Trash goes all the way to Exalted, but I wasn't able to actually verify that. In BT, you can also do another Trash farm, but this one requires you to kill three bosses first. 
you could possibly do some of the early trash. I don't really have much experience with that, but back in the day, what my guild did, we brought in like eight to 10 people and we would farm the Terran Gorfian trash. It's extremely easy trash. Main thing is you have to have cleared through like Shade of a Comma just to despawn all the other trash first. And this trash is super, super easy. It's all like CCable and you can do it with a very small group. And this is going to allow you to farm your Illidari Rune Shield, which is a really awesome shield that'll hold you over until you can get like Bulwark of Azanoth or possibly Vengeful Gladiator's Barrier or the uh, Archimon Shield, the Aegis. Uh, Antonidas is Aegis of Rap Concentration. And so that's a really great shield, and it'll just drop off trash. You can get it week one real easy. And you'll also be able to farm Rep for Ashtung Deathsworn to work on your Ashtung Talisman of Zeal. You're also going to be able to farm more gems, more Hearts of Darkness. Those are both things that are going to be in short supply. Really good to get a nice surplus of those early and this trash also drops ring of ancient knowledge which is as far as i know i don't know a whole lot about casters but from what i've heard this is a really awesome ring for them so you should be able to convince people really easy to, easily to come help you farm this stuff and that ring is also not unique so casters can actually get two of them so i think you'll have a pretty easy time getting your guildies to come do this farm but it does require you to kill the first three bosses in Black Temple. Um, you're going to get about 939 rep per run from this. Um, and since you are going to have already killed bosses, you aren't going to be able to just zone out and reset the instance like Agile, like I'm presuming in Agile at least. Um, but from what I recall, the trash respawn time is not too long. So I don't know the exact timer. I'll have more info on that for you this weekend, probably after I've gotten in there myself. But that's a that's a really good farm, really easy farm. If there is a bit of a respawn time, then that's just an opportunity for people to take some breaks, and then you know you can ping everybody on Discord or something when it's back up. But that's a pretty good farm, and um so when you do actually go into hajal for the first time i recommend having a trash wave list like on a second monitor or if you only have one monitor just like print one out um just so you can like reference each wave like after you clear a wave or you're getting close to clearing a wave just like look at what's coming next so you're prepared you know what to do the most dangerous waves in Hajal are going to be the waves that have A-bombs and or the waves that have casters. These are going to be Banshees and Necromancers. The Banshees and Necromancers, they both do basically Shadow Bolts, and they have for like 3k. Not a big deal if you take one, but if you take like multiple at once, it can really add up and burst you down. So Arcane Bombs are actually really nice for these. And those are going to do an AoE silence. It does require you to be an engineer. Most prop pallies are. And with like the squawk meta we've got right now, a lot of other people on your raid are probably going to be engineers as well. So if you can get arcane bombs on like a lot of your raiders, this is going to be super, super beneficial. And... The one downside is that the Arcane Bomb recipe is actually kind of rare. Depending on the server you're on, if you're on a small server, it's possible nobody even has this recipe because this is a recipe that drops off uh, world bosses from Classic and also Anixia. So it's like a really low drop chance. I think it's like 1% or less from those bosses. So try to figure out if you have somebody on your server who can actually craft these and if you don't if you're on a smaller server then your guild can actually just farm like the world bosses because if you're on a small server i doubt anybody's killing classic world bosses like the green dragons and uh, azure ghosts but 
that's something you can farm with your guild, but really, really try to have arcane bombs on as many people as you can. It's going to make these caster waves a total breeze. And for the eight bomb waves, it's really nice to have free action potions for these. They're going to stun you, and it's really, really easy for prop allies to tank this trash. You're not going to be taking a whole lot of damage. You can tank like pretty much a whole wave, no problem. Where the issue comes in is if you get stunned by an A-bomb and you lose all your avoidance when you're stunned. So we want to prevent getting stunned so we don't take a ton of damage. So free action potions are a great way to do that. They're going to make you immune to stuns for 30 seconds, but they're on a two-minute cooldown. And you're going to have some waves where you get back-to-back A-bombs between waves. So a good way to do this would be... You pop your fap on the first one, tank that wave, and then you have another tank tanking most or all of the A-bombs on the next wave, and they pop their fap on that one. So you guys can kind of just like leapfrog each other like that. One of you faps one wave, one of you faps the next wave, etc. So that's a good way to handle that. Um, alternatively, you can use like an iron shield pot. It's going to last you the full two minutes, so it'll last you for multiple A-bomb waves. In that case, you will get stunned, but you'll have a lot more armor, so you'll take less damage during the stun. Personally, I think the FAP is the better way to go. Just coordinate that with your other tanks. But the iron shield pot method can work too, I think. Um, Strathholm Holy Water is also going to be pretty nice for this trash. Almost all of it's undead. The only stuff that isn't are the Necromancers. You can use Sappers on those if you want, just to get threat on everything. You can also throw an initial Arcane Bomb. I think what I would normally do is put like a Consecration in the road, then hide behind Line of Sight, and then Sapper once they all get to me and have somebody else throw the Arcane Bomb. But that's up to you. I think both should work fine. I'm just not totally sure how much threat you're going to get from draining the mana of the casters. If it ends up being a lot of threat, you should probably just throw the Arcane Bomb on the pull. The Strathholm Holy Water is going to benefit from Righteous Fury. So you can just throw that out. You'll get around 1,000 threat. And... Those are on the general bomb cooldown. It's a one minute cooldown. So you'll probably have it up for every single trash wave. Just kind of depends how fast you're killing it. And use that on any wave that has mostly or all undead mobs. The Scourge Bane Infusion is a 15 spell power buff you can get from the Blood Elf starting zone. I believe. So this one is Horde only. I don't know if there's an Alliance equivalent of this. I couldn't find one. If there is, let me know. But I believe this is a Horde only thing. So basically, you just got to farm Spinal Dust. It's going to take you like a few minutes. These are like level 18 mobs. So you can just go out there, farm some Spinal Dust quick, just get a few of these, and you'll have an extra 15 spell power against Undead for all the Hagel trash. Pretty great. Once you have this on farm, you probably only need two of these. That'll cover the whole run. You can also get Blood Thistle. This is Blood Elf only, though. This is going to give you plus 10 spell power. So combined with Scourge, Bane, and Fusion, you're going to get 25 total spell power. This one isn't specific to Undead, though. And I have tested both of these, and they do stack with uh, Flask, Oil, and Spell Power Food. It's possible they they don't stack with like Wrath of Air Totem or something. I haven't tested that, but as far as I know, these will stack with everything. And they're going to increase like your Consecration damage by like one or two. So this is a very mid-maxi thing. You really don't need to do this. This is just, if you're into that kind of thing, go ahead and do it. I'm kind of crazy, so I'm going to do that. Um, shield spec is super important, I think, for tier 6 early on, because you're still going to have most of your tier 5 gear on, and a lot of that gear has shield block value, shield block rating, a lot of pieces have both. So 
shield spike is going to be really nice. It's going to really reduce the damage you're taking. You're going to be fighting a ton of trash and fighting lots of things that hit for a little bit of damage is where shield block shines. So shield spike, I think, is a really great talent to have for progression, at least for the first few weeks, maybe even longer if you want to. And we're a little bit of extra block value gear too. Um, something like the tier five chest is pretty nice for this. It's going to give you a lot of block value. So now I'm going to go over just some tips and tricks I've picked up for some of the bosses themselves. Um, for Anatheron, prop values are generally going to be infernal tanks. For these guys, they have an immolation aura that takes for 3k every two seconds, and they melee for about 1k, I think. So majority of the damage is fire damage. I would just wear like 244 plus buffed fire res for these. Um, I don't recommend actually killing these infernals. Just tank them off to the side, let your guild burn down and it down. So your threat's not really going to matter on these because nobody's going to actually be attacking them. So you can just go really defensive for these just to minimize the damage you're taking while you just hang on to all these infernals. You'll most likely only get two or three of them, so it shouldn't be too bad. The um, the main thing is having like 244 plus fire res. 244, if you don't know, that's the cutoff where you no longer take unresisted hits from magic damage. So that's an important benchmark to hit. And for Kazergal, one thing you can do to reduce his damage is have another tank in front of him. His cleave actually splits the damage instead of doing the same damage to everybody. So you can reduce the damage by having somebody else in front. When I tanked him on PTR, from what I remember, nobody else was in front. I think I just full-on tanked it, and it was fine. Prop values are generally going to be main tanking this boss just because of the mana drain mechanic. If we're taking damage, then we're going to get healed, which is going to give us mana back from spiritual attunement. So it makes us way less likely to actually run out of mana and blow up. So prop values are a great tank for that fight. All right, so now let's talk about some tips and tricks for Black Temple bosses. Full disclosure, I wasn't actually able to test out Black Temple on the PTR. Blizzard turned off the raid before I was actually able to get on there and test it. So these are all things I've picked up from watching streams or... Um, paying attention to various discussions about like tier six strats. So first off, uh, Supremus, he, his hitbox is pretty deceptive, it sounds like, for his hateful strike. So make sure you're up really, really close to him. Otherwise, melee can potentially take a hateful strike when you think you're in range of it, but you might not actually be. So make sure you're really, really close to him for that. Shade of a comma, you can actually bring some of the trash packs into the fight, and that's going to help you a lot because there's basically a circle of uh, channelers and you need to kill them before you can kill the boss. So if you bring in trash packs into the center of all those channelers, your warlocks are going to be able to seed of corruption off of those, and they're going to be able to AoE down all those channelers super, super quick. So that's a really nice little strat you can use. To be fair, though, this boss is extremely easy. I think even back in the day, we like one or two shot this boss, like back in 2007. So not really necessary, but it's a nice little optimization you can do. Terran Gorfiend, you may be tanking this as a prop pally. If you are, he hits really, really hard. So we're an effective HP set. Just be super, super tanky for this. Lots of stamina, lots of armor, and that's going to help you out a lot. For Gertog Blood Boil, he's going to Fell Rage somebody. Basically, he'll fixate on them. He'll start attacking them. They get like a buff, but if this is a caster or a healer, you can just bop them, and Gertog will actually just keep attacking them, even though they're invulnerable. So that's going to pretty much negate that phase. So if it's a caster or healer, just throw a bop on them. Easy peasy. If it's like a rogue or something, just I would just let them tank it. For Gertog also, 
he has an acidic wound debuff. Basically, every time he melees, he's going to put this debuff on you, and it stacks. It's going to do damage over time, and it's going to reduce your armor. Prop Pallies can actually just bubble this off once the stacks get high. So you can tank it for a while, bubble off your stacks. Make sure you have a macro that bubbles and cancel auras your Divine Shield so that you don't accidentally like kill somebody doing that. But that's going to allow you to tank him way longer. I've actually heard of people just solo tanking this boss, which is pretty cool. So that's something to definitely try to do. For Mother Shiraz, she's not supposed to be able to parry haste, but the latest thing I saw from the PCR was that she was still able to parry haste. So that's something to pay attention to. The live version we get may not be able to parry haste, but I would bet on it being able to parry haste if that is the last version we saw on the PTR. So if she is able to parry haste, you're going to increase the damage that the main tank is taking if you're auto attacking her. So you're probably just going to want to literally just sit there, not auto attack, just use holy shield. And if you can time her Saber Lash, you can like throw out some spot heals during that window between Saber Lashes. But if she's parry hasting, yeah, I would just not even auto attack, just literally sit there. Pretty boring gameplay, but hopefully they fix that. For Illidan, he's going to hit really, really hard. In my uh, Tier 6 Biss video, I gave an example set. The examples that I gave was really, really bad. I didn't have a good enough understanding of his damage at the time. You're going to want to go extremely tanky for this fight. And if you're main tanking, you need 101.8% combined dodge, parry, and block. Miss is not part of that equation because his ability sheer, it cannot miss. So you need 101.8% from just parry, dodge, and block. No miss. So... Your set for this is going to be very specific. It's going to have to be more avoidance than your typical Uncrushable set. And you're definitely going to want to favor pieces that have dodge and parry over block pieces because he hits extremely hard, so blocks aren't really going to do a whole lot for you. But a dodge and a parry, that's going to be zero damage, so you want to have as many of those as possible to reduce the chance of getting gibbed by him. And for his final phase, he's also going to enrage, and he's going to hit insanely hard. He, he already hits crazy hard to begin with, but it's going to be ridiculous once he goes in rage. So for this, some things you can do, you can use like Murrow's as lucky pocket watch. That's going to give you extra dodge, reduce the chance of getting killed. You can pop like a nightmare seed. That's going to increase your max HP, less chance of getting gipped. The battle master trinket, you could use that as well. That'll give you another HP boost, just like nightmare seed. And hopefully you'll be able to kill him in just one enrage. Could be two. Another thing you can do, you can have your Holy Pally lay on hands you. After they lay on hands, they're going to lose all their mana though. So they need to be prepared for this. They would want to lay on hands into like Mana Pot, into Divine Illumination so they can still heal. Possibly also have them with the Shadow Priest to regen their mana. But Holy Pallies can get improved Lay on Hands, which is going to increase your armor. So if you have that increased armor for the final phase, it'll make Enrage a lot more survivable. And that buff lasts two full minutes, so you're going to have it the entire final phase. So that's a good thing to consider. And you also might be a Fire Elemental tank on this fight. If you are a Fire Elemental tank, you're going to need 5.6% reduced chance to be crit. That can come from defense and resilience. Resilience is kind of the better bang for your buck way to get that. But defense will also help you out. PvP pieces are going to be huge for this. Getting to that 5.6% uncritable. So if you haven't already, farm some PvP stuff. It'll help you a lot. You can also use resilience gems. 
And if you do some other trash farms early on, you might get some of the new epic yellow gems and you could possibly um, turn those into 10 resilience gems if you really need to for this. For progression, I'd also recommend close to fire rise cap, which is 365. That'll just take some heat off your healers. Um, if you're the second fire elemental tank, you're, you don't really need to have much threat at all because you're going to have so much time to build threat before everybody's on your elemental. So if you're the second fire alley tank, I would definitely go way heavier into just survivability since your threat's not going to matter. If you're the first fire alley tank, you might want to go a little heavier into threat and you could possibly drop some fire res too. I've heard of some people playing around with only running like 244 buffed fire res for this. I'm not sure if you want to go that low. I don't have enough experience with this yet, but that's something to consider. But in general, if you're the first fire alley tank, you're going to want more threat. If you're the second fire alley tank, your threat's not really going to matter. And I'm going to have example sets for both Illidan Shear and Fire Alley Tanking in the description, so you can check those out. If you watch my tier 6 video, I have tweaked these sets a bit. The Illidan Shear set I've significantly changed with the extra information I've gathered since then. The Fire Alley sets haven't changed too much, but I have created some new ones with like some different options in case you don't have all the specific gear. So that's all I got for you. I hope all these little tips and tricks help you succeed in your first week in BT and Hygel. And thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.